The following video interview is part of the USMC VTA uh, History Project program, and we are doing the interviews from live from the reunion in 2015. It's actually today is November 1st, um, and we are talking to our members about their experiences in Vietnam. And with us today, um, we have a gentleman who served probably, I'm going to say, 66, 67 right. uh, with the Tank Battalion. I'll let him introduce himself, tell you any other information he needs about his unit, um, and then we'll get into his story. Guy, go ahead. In 1966, I arrived in country uh, at Da Nang, was assigned to uh, Charlie Company at Dong Ha. Uh, went up to Dong Ha with Charlie Company, was there for approximately two months. From there, I <coughs> went to Camp J.J. Carroll, and it was sort of a rotating uh, artillery base. Alpha Company uh, was there. They rotated out, and Bravo Company came in. And I spent the rest of my time in Vietnam with Bravo Company as a uh, tank commander in flame tanks. Um, our most uh, productive job was to, to escort road sweeps with a, another gun tank or two. And so that's what we did. And resupply uh, was out to Julin several times, Quezon, uh, Contien, Charlie II. Uh, was on probably seven different major conflicts uh, that, uh, supporting uh, 9th Marines, 26th Marines. Uh, Operation Buffalo uh, was there. We had five flame tanks there. Uh, we had a couple uh, uh, casualties, and a tank commander was taken off one, and a driver was hurt on another, so we were sort of limited. Uh, the last day that uh, we were pulling one nine out, uh, I fired the, the balance of my napalm out, and then went to the next tank and fired it out. Uh, we did get some secondary explosions. Well, the, the tree line we were, we were shooting into, uh, this went on for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, the gun tanks pulled out and we were taking out everything we could with us left over from 1-9. Everybody had been medevaced earlier. Uh, the gun tanks had some uh, KIAs on it. Uh, as we moved out, I was the last tank to leave. Um, I had thrown track a couple times before that on the operation. Uh, the track wasn't real good on my tank, and uh, my driver decided he didn't want to go up around the hill, and he went down into the flatland, and we hit a mine uh, or a bomb, whatever it was, it blew the right side of, of the track off and uh, the road wheels, and. So the tank was totally destroyed. Uh, so that was the first tank I lost in Vietnam. Uh, about three l weeks later, I, I uh, went down to Way and picked up another tank. Um, in September, uh, was going out to uh, uh, relieve Flame 2-1, uh, which had developed an air leak. Uh, that was the sixth, I believe it was, and uh, with the 26 Marines. Uh, at that time, met up with Lieutenant uh, Dernick and two other tanks uh, on the on the uh, road from Charlie Two. We proceeded out into the the compound that they had set up their CP, and uh, India Company uh, started receiving heavy fire. Uh, on a patrol they had out. Uh, if there's a book called Ambush Valley, and this is the first phase of it, uh, of the uh, battle that we were in. Uh, we were up against a regiment of North Vietnamese regulars, and uh, it was a rather uh, confused situation because the infantry had split up, got cut off, separated, uh, Lieutenant Dernick decided to take his gun tanks to go out into the, through a rice paddy. Uh, earlier I had advised him that, because I had worked that area several times, that, that those rice paddies were not 
where he wanted to be, but he was young and in country and a green lieutenant. What, what rank were you? At that time, I was Lance Corporal. Okay. Uh, every time I lost a tank, I got promoted. <laughs> I was a PFC. Uh, uh, I was instructor at Camp Pendleton, and when I got to Nam, uh, I knew just about everything there was about a flame tank, and there wasn't too many experienced flame tankers. Everybody wanted to be in gun tanks. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was up on higher ground, uh, and Lieutenant Dernick was insisting I come down into the rice paddy. At that time, I, the view I had was very, very good. I could see the uh, infantry coming, the, the Vietnamese. I advised him that and told him I wanted to light up, be, uh, fire my napalm up, mm -hmm. and uh, spray the, the area to the left of us or to the south of us. He advised me not to do anything. Don't fire, because he didn't know where he was at or where the infantry was at and he wasn't listening quite well to uh, the infantry at that time or to anyone else, but uh, he received two or three rounds in his engine compartment and that tank was knocked out and then he had the gun tanks form around him for protection. I eventually pulled down into the rice paddy as the evening went on and we spent the night in the rice paddy. The next day we pulled his tank out and uh, all the KAs that we had uh, back to a safe area to be loaded out. Uh, that was the first phase of Operation Buffalo, or op uh, Ambush Valley. Right. It was a very, uh, uh, in that period of time, uh, there was a couple Antos with us, and uh, so it was, uh, we had a lot of firepower. It was just a matter of being able to direct it in the right areas. The next day was uh, quiet, uh, the following day, they'd sent out patrols, and uh, around 10 o'clock, the Marine Corps had some way of not sending out anybody until mid-morning uh, or early afternoon. Okay. And so, <laughs> as they proceeded out, they'd become under heavy fire, and uh, uh, we were ordered by the infantry to, to uh, give them some support. Uh, at this time, there was two gun tanks and my flame tank. Uh, Lieutenant Dernick decided he'd stay up on high ground now, and he was up on the side of a hill and through a track. Uh, so he ordered uh, Gunny Tatum and me to go proceed uh, down for closer support. We did, and as we come up onto this ridge, uh, I was down at the bottom of it and I had a good view of a rice paddy and we were receiving very he uh, heavy artillery fire, mortar fire. Uh, I looked over in the rice paddy and it was uh, uh, a story like it would be in Hollywood. All of a sudden the rice paddy come alive and they stood up and started moving towards uh, the top of the hill where the CP had been set up the night before. I had a sky mounted 50. I had taken the 50 out of the cupola and mounted it on top of my tank. It was difficult to yeah. charge? Yeah, yeah, you only had 50 rounds in that little box and it laying on its side. So I had a tripod already mounted on top of my tank uh, and I had the 50 up there. We started opening up on the rice paddy as the, in Ambush Valley, if, uh, if you read that section of it, of the book, the infantry described it as uh, bowling pins being struck down by bowling balls. Wow. And uh, my gunner uh, just was relentless in, excuse me, in firing. <clears throat> and as it proceeded for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, he would fire a very long burst and uh, I could see the round starting to tumble, this tracers a little bit. Uh, and my 50 caliber, I had to get out and get some more ammo twice out of the gypsy rack. And so we were quite busy. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, we hadn't received any direct fire to my tank. The gunning was up on top of the hill, and I could hear his firing across the ridge uh, in a five minute period of time, looking up to see him and back to the rice paddy. His tank got hit. Uh, 
there was three casualties on the tank. Uh, RPG. RPGs. Okay. Uh, the tank was on fire, smoking when it come down the, uh, from the top of the hill. Um, uh, the driver, Ryle, Louis Ryle, brought the tank down up alongside me and he says, says they're coming. And that's the last words I remember from him. And I looked over to the left and I could see three RPG teams all firing at the same time. Uh, the first two missed, the second one was very lucky. Uh, we received a round right beside the uh, uh, blast shield where it would be for a gun tank, but where our tube come out of. As it penetrated, it set off the ammonized fuel, which is a gasoline type fuel that we used to light the napalm with. Uh, and my driver, or my gunner, had just set up the system and we were ready to fire and we had the shroud lit at the end of the gun tube, but when we got hit, that just uh, put fuel everywhere. We bailed out of the tank. Uh, as I jumped out, my gunner almost passed me getting out of the, the TC hatch. As I ran across the back of the tank, uh, now that I think back, it was kind of funny because I still had my comm helmet on with the yo-yo cord, and the next thing I knew, I was laying flat on the back, uh, on my back, on the back of the tank where the cord has jerked me backwards. I got rid of that, uh, jumped off the back of the tank and realized I had a 45 and uh, two magazines. My uh, driver had been burned across the shoulders and the medics were taking him. Uh, my gunner uh, had a burnt hand and a little shrapnel. Uh, we scrounged up a couple weapons. Uh, I had been using an M79 grenade launcher that I had picked up the two days before and I didn't bring it with me when I left the tank. It was hanging on the turret, but I didn't, didn't grab it. Uh, just didn't really have enough time. Yeah. Uh, so we're on the ground. Uh, Louis jumps out of his tank. It's still running, and mine's starting to blaze real nice. Uh, we ran over and got into a bomb crater. We helped some other Marines, and then we took a defensive position up, trying to figure out which way to go because they were everywhere. Okay. Uh, we moved from that large bomb crater to a smaller one where there were a couple more uh, wounded uh, infantry at. Uh, we helped those grunts and uh, we were able to fend off a few of the uh, Vietnamese and pick up some of their grenades and in fact I brought one back to the States with really? me after I disarmed Ticom. it, a Ticom wow. grenade. That's in my man cave I have it said <laughs> but uh, it took us probably an hour to get back up behind our lines. And as we were going back up, I saw the gun tank sitting there. I'm going, Dernick, where are you? <laughs> yeah. uh, they didn't even stay in the, the tank to give us any support for or anything. They had dropped the breach and took off Holy early. God. So uh, we got back up to the top of the hill. We received uh, mortar fire, small arms fire, all night long. Uh, Puff was there uh, previously when we were pinned down in the rice paddy uh, three days before that. Uh, they had, Puff was there all night and the flare ships and uh, artillery firing loomed over us from uh, Contian and, and Charlie too. That night you, it was amazing how much, it was like brightest day all night long. It was a slow drizzle. So it was a very uncomfortable. Uh, one of the tank crew off of uh, getting Tatum, uh, Tatum's tank uh, died from the wounds and pneumonia, I believe, uh, on the hospital ship. Uh, next, that night, uh, the next thing that happened was uh, the commander of uh, a major that was there with uh, 26 Marines, the, the tank is still running and we can see movement around in that area. Uh, he ordered a law uh, rocket launcher uh, to disable the tank. Well, the tank was sitting sideways, so he couldn't get a shot at the engine compartment. So I went down with him to the edge of the perimeter, and I said, now, where you want to aim at is right where the flat part and the turret meets. Mm -hmm. uh, 
he took aim, but it was a little high. He was he had went about 20 yards outside of the perimeter to where he could get a good shot, closer shot, and a good shot. But the law round went right straight, ricocheted off, went right straight in the air. On his way back in, one of his fellow Marines shot him in the flight jacket because he didn't identify himself right, or I guess, I don't know. But he was really upset about that. Yeah. And uh, he had a, his whole shoulder was bruised up. He was uh, injured, but uh, didn't break the skin. Uh, the next morning, uh, Alpha Company at Charlie Two uh, come out to assist us and pull us out, bring us back in. And their instruction was to tow the uh, flame tank back up out of there. Well, uh, they were on the, the road going from Charlie Two to Contien. Uh, they started receiving uh, some small arms uh, mortar fire. Uh, Louis Rowell and I went down to the tank that was running and I got in a TC's hatch, the radio still worked, uh, the fire was, had not did any damage to any of the electronics or, to, wow. or the tour. Uh, the penetration I think had, uh, uh, had set off a, a Willie Peter round or something and it, when it burned out it was over with. So uh, Louis drove the tank back up the hill, and as we got up there, we received a tremendous amount of fire. Uh, the uh, tank commander uh, in charge of the three tanks from Alpha coming to come out to help pull us out. Uh, he s said, let's saddle up, get out of here. Well, we were already moving, so we got back to Charlie too before anybody else. But you had no, um, you had no flame. We had no, you, should we, about 15 and 30, were they operable? Uh, on the, uh, uh, this is a gun tank that we're bringing back. Oh, okay. The flame tank burned all night. It was still burning the next morning, okay, the right. napalm was. Yeah. And, uh, and the fuel and everything else was, you know, it just laid there all night and the next morning until eight, nine o'clock was still burning. Wow. As we got to Charlie Two, they had called in an airstrike to destroy the tank, my tank, the flame tank. And so uh, it was. Uh, it was a loss anyway. But they yeah, they just made sure that the Vietnamese uh, there was nothing they could get off of it or recognize exactly right. what everything was there. Uh, Louie and I uh, got back there, and the UPI took a photo. One of the ph photographers did of me uh, climbing out of the TC's hatch, and there's two holes in the side of the tank and the tour right there below my feet. Yep. And uh, they were nice enough to send that picture with a telegram to my mother, uh, stating I was all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the headline in the New York Times was, uh, or uh, the caption was, uh, tanks for the memory. <laughs> so we, uh, wow. it was a rather uh, trying, very trying experience. I think it was a major conflict that uh, very little has been written about except yeah. Ambush Valley. Uh, there was no long uh, field reports from anyone. Uh, Lieutenant Dernick's report was, uh, for the whole operation, was like a page and a half on a notebook paper. So uh, wow. uh, they never recognized exactly what went on there. Uh, but uh, I felt that we had could have turned the battle around the first day if uh, I would was able to. Well, I was ordered not to fire yeah. my 50 caliber or a flame. If we'd have been able to do it then, then they'd realize what they were up against. Yeah. And then uh, when walking up into that, the last few hours of the fighting that I was involved in there was. Uh, we were just outnumbered so massively. It was just like wave after wave. Just they just kept coming. Yeah. But uh, it was a, a, a time in my life I'll never forget. Yeah. That, uh, it sounds like that, and, and these are some of the reports that I saw about that same time. That there was over a battalion uh, of the MBA in that area operating and moving south. And, and the, there was a regiment of NVA on the next hill back. Uh, uh, a battalion had hit them the first day, and then when they we run into them, they were 
it was unlimited. Yeah. The next day out at Rice Paddy, uh, or several days later when they got back into that area, the, the infantry did, uh, there was a lot of drag marks, but they didn't find any bodies at right. all. And so uh, the Vietnamese didn't like to leave any casualties yeah, right. around so we could get a, a, yeah. a accurate account of what the, the kill was. But uh, uh, very glad for uh, a crew, uh, Louis Rao's crew, uh, Gunny Tatum, and my crew, uh, I think we performed under the circumstances, outstanding. Oh, I, I agree. That's incredible. And if we'd had a little more support uh, from another flame, from another gun tank, I think that everything would have been come out a little differently. Yeah. Yeah. But when you have one flame tank and one gun tank, it uh, somebody is losing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And usually we operated uh, two gun tanks with one flame tank. That right. was a general rule. Yeah. So. But uh, I, I enjoyed uh, getting another new tank when I got back. Uh, about three weeks later, I uh, went back down to Wei, or Fubai, and picked up another new tank and brought flame? it. Flame tank, okay. yes. Fine. I was in flame tanks uh, all the time I was in Vietnam. Uh, when I got back to the States, uh, I decided I didn't want to be in tanks any longer because I'd been on the tank ramp at Camp Del Mar and then over in, in Nam. So I uh, knew the first sergeant when I checked in and I said, do anything with me you want to, but don't put me in tanks. <laughs> oh. So I got in the dispersing office and I was in finance then until, uh, oh, is that right? until I got out. Wow, what a difference. Uh, and I was able to get a couple other uh, tankers uh, yeah into the dispersing office also, and so uh, it was a much easier job oh, gosh. than busting track and pulling torsion bars yeah. and road wheels and Absolutely. cleaning gun tubes. When did you come home? What year? Uh, 1967, just after Christmas, okay. uh, was uh, in Okinawa uh, just before New Year's and was in travel uh, back to uh, the States. And then I, I got home the 2nd or 3rd of January. How long did you stay in? Uh, I was, was a reservist when I joined. Uh, I was in college and joined the Marine Corps Reserves. And then uh, it was a six month active duty. After I got to, to uh, uh, San Diego, I decided that I really didn't like this marching so I shipped over from uh, being a 0311 to an 1811. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and I had to fake it because when we were going to the track vehicle school or before they assigned us what school we were going to, we had to swim in the swimming pool. So uh. I didn't swim very well that day. <laughs> Bad choice, right? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be on the ground, not yeah. on the water. Yeah. yeah. But oh. it was a... Uh, uh, my time in the Corps was uh, an experience. It's helped me a lot in life. Uh, it's it motivated me, and uh, I have some very close friends in the Corps, and uh, it's an experience that uh, every young man, if he has an opportunity, should take. Exactly, I agree with you 100%. Well, that's great. And Guy, I'm gonna refer to my notes because I wanna say, right, say this right. Guy Wolfenbarger. Barger. Barger. B-A-R-G-E-R. -E okay. Wolfenbarger. Great. Well, thank you, Guy, for sharing a, a remarkable story, um, one that, that um, obviously you remember well uh, for just the details that you had about where you were and what you did and things like that. Uh, so often when we talk about this so late in our careers and so long ago from so long ago, we're kind of guessing at dates, times, places, and so forth, but your details were, were very, very well done. We appreciate your doing the interview. I did a, uh, a uh, story for uh, Vietnam Historical Society. Uh, oh, great. Tanks Historical Society. And uh, it has a lot more detail than, than our short conversation here has been, but uh, uh, the, I think the, uh, Marine Corps Vietnam Tankers Association has done wonders to keep us together and also inspire us to uh, 
think about all the good things yeah. and all the good friends that we have in the Corps. Well, that's true. That is so true. Well, again, thank you very much, and uh, we'll do this again in two years. All right. Okay.